Hi everyone, welcome along to DigiShift 73 Beyond Algorithms, AI, Equity and the Future of Fair Hiring. So we're going to be talking today about artificial intelligence and the modern era of recruitment. It promises streamlined, efficient and unbiased hiring, but does the reality match the aspiration and what does the future hold for this? So we've got two really good speakers today. We've got Viana Maya, who's a dedicated anti-racism edu anti educator and career development coach. And we've also got Lewis David Pointer, talent lead at Public Digital. Um, and we're going to explore in not just AI driven hiring, um, but some of the algorithmic biases within it and whether this can perpetuate or challenge historical racial injustices. And particularly as we're in Black History Month, we thought this was a, a fitting topic to explore. So when you're thinking about questions today, I'd like to be thinking about the different ways that AI has been used in hiring your own organization or some of the conversations you've had, uh, some of your questions around benefits and risks. Um, some of the strategies for mitigating bias, um, and we'll, we'll have a discussion about how we use AI to create a more equitable and inclusive hiring process. So um, I think, Lewis, you're going to go up first, aren't you? Come on. Yes, yeah, I will. Let me just quickly share my, uh, share my screen. Uh, so first of all, hi, everyone. Um, so uh, yeah, my name is, is Lewis. Uh, I'm the talent lead uh, at Public Digital. Uh, so we do a lot of digital transformation uh, projects within the public sector. Um, and in my role, I kind of head up recruitment there. So I've been quite interested both within the, uh, the recruitment side of things, um, but then also the uh, uh, the AI side of things, given given what we do as an organization. Um, just before I get started, can I just double check? Can people uh, can people see the, the presentation? Good, excellent, always good to hear. Um, so uh, let's get... Oh. Let's get started. Uh, so first of all, just quick um, introduction to myself. Uh, so I've been working in recruitment now since 2016. Um, I started working in uh, agency for Michael Page, uh, moved in the house after that, and I've kind of worked my way through a number of organizations, um, kind of directly or, or with RPOs. Uh, so I've worked for, for Debenhams, for Thames Water, a company called Activate Learning, and uh, also with Deloitte, and now, as I mentioned, uh, leading the talent function within public digital. Um, just a quick uh, kind of, I, I guess, uh, clarifier, I'm not an expert on AI. Uh, I'm speaking kind of purely as a recruiter from what I've seen uh, from uh, a recruitment perspective. Um, so if you want advice on the more technical side of things, uh, I know some people in our organization that can talk through it. Um, but yeah, myself, I'm, I'm not an expert on AI. This is just kind of my, what I've seen and um, what I've come across from, from using it. Um, start off with a, with a bit of a quote here. Um, the potential for AI in the recruitment process is best for large companies and could radically alter the hiring process. Uh, despite having a top-notch HR team, any large company can easily get overwhelmed trying to pick the best candidate for an open position with so much to consider in every applicant. Stacking them all up against each other uh, can make for a difficult to compare and contrast process. This is where AI arrives to smooth the rough edges. Um, this has kind of been the sales pitch of, of AI within recruitment recently, and, and I get it uh, sold to me quite a lot. Uh, I get a lot of people contacting me about AI and how we could use it in our organization. Um, and this is often kind of the big sell is that it will um, make things easier for us. Uh, it will, you know, streamline the process. You can, you know, you can take away a lot of that human effort. Um, and as someone who uh, at the moment is a team of one uh, when it comes to recruitment, that is uh quite tempting uh, to have a lot of uh, the, those sorts of more mundane tasks taken off my hands. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is kind of what I've seen uh, with regards to AI, uh, some of the pros, the potential pros of it, some of the potential cons of it, um, and uh, how it's also being used by some candidates to potentially kind of game the process. Um, so potential kind of benefits of AI use and recruitment, and again, these are kind of things that have been sold to me. So first of all, kind of time savings is, is probably the biggest sales pitch I've had. Um, I, to, to give you a bit of a, an example, I once uh, recruited a role uh, in one of my previous companies, uh, a PA position for the CEO. Um, we received in three days over 750 applications. Uh, my first review of CVs removed only half of those applications, um, and it took three full days to review the CVs, and I had to go through and review them over and over again each time, getting rid of more people from the process and kind of becoming stricter in what I was uh, using to assess people. Um, 
the sales pitch with AI, and I've, I've had this from numerous different companies, is that in theory, uh, the AI tools could potentially do this in, in seconds. Um, they could look at all the applications, uh, rank them based on who would be uh, strongest and, uh, and and show me you know which candidates we should be processing. Um, and for someone who once spent three days reviewing 750 CVs over and over and over again, um, that is incredibly uh, tempting. Um, Cost savings. Uh, so again, time is is money. So kind of linked to the time savings. Um, as as a recruiter, you know I've reviewed thousands of CVs, uh, often hundreds a, a day, um, and uh, reviewing that many CVs often requires uh, large teams. Um, I've worked in organisations. I mean, uh, when I was with Deloitte previously, uh, I believe the recruitment team there was somewhere in the region around hundred people. Um, and it, it takes, you know, it takes time, it takes money. Um, and again, the uh, the kind of benefit that we've been sold of HR, uh, of AI tools, is that um, by saving that time and by taking a lot of that human um, activity away, uh, you would reduce your team size and you would therefore save money. Um, Less drop plates. So um, we are, you know, we are human beings. And as human beings, we, we often make mistakes. Um, and there are numerous examples that you'll find if you've ever been through a recruitment process of where you kind of notice these these drop plates. Um, an example of that, a friend of mine was recently going through a, a, a job hunt um, last year, uh, went through a, a number of application processes, and he actually texted me uh, while I was writing this presentation saying that a year after applying for a job, he just received a, a rejection email from, from the company in question. Um, which, you know, a year later, so funnily enough, he'd already found a job um, and wasn't in need of one. And that's just kind of an example of, you know, what's happened there is, is his applications got lost in the process. At some point, someone has clicked a button and um, and it's sent a rejection email. Again, the sales pitch that we get uh, on AI is that because a lot of this process could be automated um, and be done by an AI tool, you're not going to have those, uh, those drop plate, uh, plates. You're not going to have those situations happening. Um, reduced bias in decision making now uh, uh, this is something that we'll get talked about a bit, a bit later as well but one of the again one of the kind of sales pitches that I've had with regards AI is that AI is is a machine it's objective um, you know less decisions being made by humans uh, means less uh, chance for, for human bias and therefore it'll make the process uh, fairer uh, it'll make the process more objective and you're less likely to have um kind of incidences of of bias um kind of within the recruitment process i'll talk about that a little bit later when i get on to pitfalls um but from my experience that's that's actually not necessarily been the case um no missed candidates again an automated process uh you know you, you're not going to have candidates that get missed one of the things that happens in recruitment and um you again you may have experienced it yourself if you've ever gone through a job uh, application process is you you can get kind of lost in the system um you you know you, you have candidates who apply very late in the process where maybe um interviews have already started maybe there's already a preferred candidate in mind um you can have situations where a candidate just gets lost in, in the ats system um and again there's there's been suggestions that you could use ai to alert the recruitment team that potentially a kind of in inverted commas better candidate has applied uh, to the process than the candidates that you have in process already um, and that would then alert recruitment to maybe get that candidate involved uh, and in theory you would get the best candidate for the job um better candidate experience so uh, again you know candidates receive better communications they receive quicker decisions um, interviews can be arranged quickly that you know there's AI tools that can can sort and arrange interviews automatically again the the, the sales pitch that we've had is is that um, you know AI automating all these processes uh, means that the candidates will get a better experience and will come away with a more positive experience from the process um, and uh, kind of, I guess, finally, the the, the other sales um, pitch that uh, that we've had is is a reduced reliance on recruiter expertise. So, I mean, I've I've been in recruiting um, since twenty sixteen, as I mentioned. I've been recruiting and consulting for the last few years, um, and I've you know I've built up a decent knowledge of the sector that I work in. But I'm by no means an expert. As I said, I I don't know about uh, digital transformation and 
I, as much as I can build up expertise in what I'm looking for, what type of candidates that I'm looking for, um, you know, I'm I'm not an expert in that area, and I rely on the hiring managers to to kind of inform me of what they're looking for. And sometimes this may mean that I just miss a good CV. I, you know, maybe it's perhaps written with terms that I've not heard before. Maybe it's written in a way that I potentially it just doesn't trigger uh, trigger some of the um, keywords that I'm looking for. Um, and it might mean that I just miss a, a good candidate for the job because uh, because I'm not that expert in in that area. Uh, and again, the, the the kind of the pitch with AI is that you can review CVs based on keywords, you can review it based on experience, and in theory, those mistakes um, shouldn't happen. Um, so that's that's kind of the pitch. That's what we've been kind of sold uh, with AI and the benefits that come from it. Um, what what potentially are, are the challenges with it, and and what uh, have I noticed in kind of reality? Um, first of all, uh, flawed technology. So. AI is consistently improving. I mean, it's come on leaps and bounds just within the last year. It's continuing to um, to get better. It's continuing to get more advanced, um, but it is still flawed in some ways. Um, we've had uh, situations where I've had uh, AI technology um, kind of trigger. There's there's tools that can detect uh, AI usage by candidates, uh, which again is something I'll come on to a little bit later, but candidates are starting to use AI to, to maybe answer screening questions, answer uh, uh, to write their CVs, uh, that sort of thing. And there's tools that can apparently detect AI usage. Um, unfortunately, uh, when this has been tested on some occasions, uh, it is flagging AI usage when there isn't actually AI usage. Um, there is a tendency with AI technology for uh, bias. Um, and again, that's something I'll, I'll come on to a little bit later, but it's been noticed that um, AI technology does tend to um, often uh, have biases against certain types of, uh, of candidates. Um, there's been kind of the usual th issues with technology of system breaches, um, technology just failing. Uh, and so there is an element that I found where while the potential is there, we've got to be aware that the technology is not perfect. It's still being developed. Um, and uh, we're possibly at a, still at an early stage where perhaps there are some some kinks that need to be worked out of the system. Um, cost uh, is, is another major challenge that we found. At Public Digital, we're, we're not the, uh, the biggest organization. We don't have uh, we don't have huge budgets when it comes to recruitment, um, and uh, I've, I've sometimes found it somewhat laughable the uh, the quotes that I've received from companies on on how they can transform our recruitment process for uh, the the very cheap price of a, a few hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, and uh, so what what uh, what we found is because we're in this early stage with AI technology, it can often be very expensive. Um, and the cost means that it can sometimes be that it's only the larger firms that potentially. Uh, AI becomes more cost efficient where they can potentially replace larger teams um, and, and uh, the, um, an overall answer um, on technology. Um, so this, I guess, is something that ap applies in all forms of life. Um, but, you know, we're, we're increasingly becoming over-reliant on technology. Uh, we find these situations where, where the technology does fail and, um, you know, as, as a society, we are perhaps not equipped on how to deal with that as much as we used to be. Um, and so again, that's something to consider when when using AI within recruitment. It's something that I've been considering in, in my role is, you know, what if the tech fails? What if um, the system provider goes bankrupt and, and closes down? Um, are you at greater risk of, of um, kind of hacking and digital attacks? Are there risks to um, data security? Um, these are all things that need to be considered when when inviting AI into your recruitment process, because ultimately, the more you rely on technology, uh, the more you're potentially at risk if, uh, if the system fails or if something goes wrong. Um, and that, again, can affect both uh, the business and potentially the candidate uh, experience as well. Um, Increased bias. So I said I'd, I'd kind of come on to this. Um, there have been kind of numerous examples of, of recruitment uh, AI having issues with bias. Um, ultimately, AI is not true AI. We, ha we haven't actually created true artificial intelligence. It is 
uh, based on programming. It is based on programming that has been designed by humans. Um, and uh, a lot of AI uh, assesses uh, data and information that is out there that, again, is has kind of uh, come from uh, humans and humanity. Uh, and bias, unfortunately, does uh, still exist within humanity. Um, if prior bias exists, AI will tend to... Um, tend to copy it because ultimately it's assessing the data and making uh, decisions based on that. And there's been a number of examples of, uh, of AI recruitment tools uh, becoming increasingly racist, uh, becoming increasingly sexist uh, when it's making decisions. And um, weirdly, and, and there's, uh, it's worth looking up, it's quite amusing, uh, a, a love of lacrosse players. Uh, one, one piece of AI technology seemed to overwhelmingly uh, appreciate lacrosse players um, when when assessing them um, and see to put, remarkably put them through to interviews. So um, there's been a number of issues with this, and again, it's it's something that that has been looked at. It's something that needs to be considered. Um, while the sales pitch has always been that it will remove bias from the process, um, actually, a lot of the time with technology, it's been found uh, that that hasn't necessarily been the case. Um, Miss candidates. So I said uh, that um, you know th this is something that apparently AI will remove from the system. The problem is, is that with uh, situations like uh, the bias that that sometimes these systems tend to have, it does lead to the potential for candidates to be missed. It's possible that if a CV is written um, potentially poorly or is written in a way that um, doesn't hit keywords. Um, which is often how these systems uh, tend to to review CVs that strong applicants won't get through the systems. And I've seen this in practice with with tools that I've um, had demos to demo to me in the past, and with tools that I've utilised. Um, if a CV is written in a certain way that doesn't pick what the technology is looking for, you can have a very good CV that will get scored very badly. Um, just because it doesn't happen to mention certain keywords that, that, that the the uh, the technology is looking for, so there is that risk of um, of candidates being missed. Um, uh, one example of this uh, is um, goes back to a, a while back when we were all being told that psychometric testing was the way forward, um, and um, this was something that was going to be the the future of recruitment. And I remember a, a story a uh, situation that I had uh, when I worked for agency where I was told um, that uh, they wouldn't be progressing a candidate of mine who had gone through three rounds of interviews uh, and was the candidate they wanted for the job because the psychometric test had told them uh, that this candidate was not suitable to be a tax manager. Um, this was a candidate with 25 years of experience as a tax manager um, and uh, they, they refused to progress this candidate any further because the technology had told them no. Um, so again, potential to, to be a little bit um, cautious with, with that. Um, there is the possibility for a worse candidate experience. So at the, man, uh, at the moment, um, there's been examples that uh, candidates who have gone through uh, AI-related recruitment processes can often tell when they're speaking to AI, uh, when they're dealing with chatbots, when they're dealing with technology rather than human beings. Um, and it's not always the case that AI technology is scoring higher on, on candidate experience. Um, it can feel uh, impersonal. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the, uh, the, the day, uh, human issues are still going to exist. AI cannot run a full process. Uh, you still need to have interviews with human beings. Um, there are That means that human biases are still going to be involved in the process. Um, so while AI can fix some of the issues uh, potentially in the process, and there is that potential there, you've got to be aware that you've still got to solve the issues with the human beings that are always going to have to be involved in the, uh, in the recruitment process. Um, and then quickly, just to move on to uh, application gaming. So this is this is something that uh, I've noticed and is something that kind of caused a bit of my interest uh, more recently within AI recruitment. So um, this came about because I, we, we use uh, assessment questions as part of our process to, to try and keep the process uh, more unbiased. And one uh, one candidate uh, that I had answers uh, to to the application questions, um, their first answer to the first question uh, started off uh, as an AI program language model. Uh, I don't have personal interests or motivations. Now, um, obviously, this candidate had used ChatGPT to answer the question and perhaps hadn't read through the answer before uh, before submitting it. Um, but what it showed us is that candidates are starting to utilize AI uh, in their re uh, recruitment process. They're utilizing 
using it to um, potentially answer questions. Um, there's been examples where AI has successfully completed Google's um, programming test for, for junior programmers, um, and it's being used to write CVs. And what we found is that this has actually meant that we're having to rethink our uh, recruitment process. Um, and it's actually made it harder for us to run a fairer process. Um, in our current process, what we do is we we anonymize uh, all applications. Uh, we we review the applications purely on the basis of their answers to the application questions. Um, and what we're finding is that because more and more candidates are using ChatGPT to answer these questions, um, we're actually having to move away from that and we're having to move back to more of a uh, CV review based process. So it's actually, an, it, unfortunately for us, making the process uh, less uh fair less unbiased um because we're going back away from that more anonymized process and that's something that we're having to rethink um we're looking at other tools to potentially allow us to keep that anonymized process but it, it's caused us uh certain amounts of um wasted time it's caused us um uh, time to to kind of reconsider the process and so um while again AI uh, has a number of benefits to it. It's something that we found that actually from a, a candidate perspective, it's it's actually making the process um, uh, worse from our perspective um, and something that we've had to, to reconsider. Um, so I guess to conclude, um, and a, another quote there that I found quite interesting, true AI doesn't exist yet. And ultimately AI is a tool that's created by humans and it has many of the flaws uh, that its human creators have or it's learning from human behavior um, and so it has many potential benefits and applications in recruitment but we still have to be very careful that the technology is sound uh, that it's used ethically um, and that we consider the potential uh, challenges that come with it there's a lot of benefits from it and i think as technology advances it will become more and more useful within recruitment um but i guess my overall conclusion is uh we need to tread carefully at this uh, point of time it's, it's still very early days um and there are still a number of flaws uh, within that process but thank you very much amazing thank you Lewis. hey sorry for the kind of hey, stop starting the, the recordings i hope it was that uh, was okay I think we'll hand over just quickly to Diana and then we're going to have a chance for questions from everyone. There's some good questions coming in the chat box and keep those keep those coming as we as we go as well. Hello. Um, thank you very much for that, Lewis. Um, I don't think I'm going to go too much into the pros and con the pros of AI. Um, Lewis, you've covered that really well. But I'm going to go into some of the cons. So I'm just gonna hopefully be able to share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Oh. All right. All right. And so there's quite a few you probably have heard from there. There's a lot of um a lot of AI recruitment software organizations have lots of bronze. They obviously want us to use these tools. Um and some of it can be great in terms of how we use it, but right now in terms of recruiting, I put this uh, quote here, um, statement here by Amazon. In 2018, Amazon killed its AI recruitment software because it found that it was discriminating against women. Um, and the reason being is looking into the type of data set that was inputted to, uh, to use this tool tend to um, favor men more because they had the tech skill for the various jobs they were recruiting for. And they, they tried various ways to try to um, ensure that this system would work, but it didn't work um, for people. So um, Amazon themselves decided to um, remove it. Excuse me. I don't know why my... Good. Okay. So in terms of um, AI recruitment software, we know that... Um, as Lewis explained, that it, it requires a data set to be inputted. So in that data set, who are the people behind um, creating that? This is where we find bias in terms of um, migrants, um, women, male, et cetera, um, in, our, in our systems. It overlooks the quality of individuals um, that are applying. Yes, it might find the right candidate in what people are looking for in terms of what you want in that role, it overlooks nuances. 
Um, if we're using um, video, for example, um, I was looking at Pi Matrix, who are the top um, software that's used for recruiting individuals. This is an organization that has a background in cognitive, um, uh, cognitive, um, excuse me, I've lost my, I've lost my notes in the thread. So I'm trying to not repeat too much of what, um, what Lewis has included here. Let me just get my notes up. With me two seconds. Excuse me. I'm just going to change my screen because my notes is in a different space. Take your time, Mr. Rush. No worries. That's what happens when you jump away from your main points. Right. Let's start again. Mm. I apologize. This is where I almost think we should have like some elevator music for a moment like this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I've got too many, right. too many screens open. I just need to find the right one. So there's quite a lot in terms of um um of in here. Um so for example, um looking through what Amazon had done, they have embedded a new system by an Oxford uh, professor who um have created the tools to actually read through the bias within the system. So right now it's behind the scene, they're working through they're working through how to uh, recognize either discrimination, racism, etc. But what they're finding is that we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to do the work that we're currently not doing in terms of re, um, restructuring a recruitment process as human beings. We're still talking about anti-racism and conscious bias, et cetera. But we can't give all of that to AI to then solve if the data set that's used is not correct to the reality that we live in, in here. Um, in terms of the technology limitation, again, we are using face recognitions, um, so ten, tend to read facial people's expressions, how they respond to a question. Uh, something that came out that was really interesting, it was talking about how AI, for example, all of us here have used Alexa or some sort of voice, voice recognition. It still doesn't work for Scottish accents, where it tries to manipulate what that request is. And in inputting that, you're finding that there's a lot of rejection that comes from a cognitive that doesn't understand the nuances of people, language, what's been said behind the scene, the emotions, etc. So these things can't be inputted in there. Um, transparency and accountability for these organizations. Right now, we can't really say that AI in recruitment works because AI in recruitment, we're finding that uh, unemployment is high in the UK, for example. If people are going through systems that's rejecting quality talent, so for example, uh, Lewis, you were talking about your friend who had applied year, a year ago only to get a response now. We're seeing, for us as an organisation that works in employability, we're seeing quality ca candidates with skill set who are struggling to get into opportunities. Are we wondering, is it that they're encountering biased systems, biased data, if organisations are using AI as a first point of checking who comes into the organization. So in that, we're losing quality talent if we're relying on AI or AI recruitment systems to select the right candidate. And what does selecting the right candidate actually look like? That's a question to ask the recruitment organization. 
the human element. Um, when when Lewis and I were having this good discussion, we were just talking about that there are specific jobs that require that human touch. Uh, so in terms of AI, AI is still learning. Um, most of us in this room are probably use chat G GPT. Um, and if you've used it correctly, you probably would have sat there for about 20, 30, however, however minute to create various products, various content using chat GPT. So that is still learning your elements and you've had to have corrected that. So when I'm using AI, I use it like as my intern. I'd sometimes have to correct it and say, you know, okay, use the right kind of language. Um, I'm working in, in diversity and equity. I have to tell my AI how to write in the way that it represents a diverse or inclusive response. So if we are relying on AI recruitment systems, again, the question is, what are we putting in there to make sure that we're getting that human element, right? So we're missing out on the human element. In terms of historical data bias, at the moment, we haven't seen enough um, research in regards to a recruitment, you know, if it, if this is actually working. We're hearing some of the positives from organizations that create these systems, but seeing and reading the experience of um, Amazon, although they didn't go into detail, the fact that they they basically had to park and remove the software that was creating um, discrimination against women, it didn't list any what other discrimination would be there. We know, for example, in the in the US, AI has been used in various um, areas. So in in um, in justice system, in terms of mortgages, um, there's a report that says between forty to eighty percent of uh, uh, black individuals are rejected in a mortgage using AI system. And again, the reason being is the data set that's used is historical. And historically, people who would have got mortgages in the US would have been uh, white individuals. So bring that back into recruitment. This is where we'll see discrimination increase and we're seeing it favor men more or white male more because we have a data and a history of who has been in different position and different types of role. So again, uh, looking at the legal and ethical aspect of the of AI, how we are using this ethically. Um, one of the questions I would have, and something that I'm interested in researching when it comes to AI and anti-racism, equity, uh, discrimination, et cetera, is, are we going to take away the responsibility and the, the work that we're currently doing to remove biases in human beings and depending that and, and giving that responsibility to AI legally, if AI then is creating or perpetrating bias and discrimination, who do we who do we point the finger to? Who's responsible for, for that legal implication? Um, who's responsible for that, uh, the risk or, you know, if we were to take uh, AI to court, for example, in organizations using AI in terms of the dis discriminative way, who's responsible um, for that there? Um, a documentary that I'll definitely recommend for everyone if you haven't seen it already, Coded Bias um, in Netflix, if it's still there. Um, there's other articles that I can share that is mostly around um, what people are discussing, is mostly around taking away the responsibility for us as human to do our due diligence when it comes to our diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism before we can fully rely on um, AI to take over who we recruit in our organizations. We really need to continue that work as human beings and then look at how are we educating our AI system to start to recruit the right candidate. And again, what does the right candidate look like? Um, what does that mean to you as an organization? And we have to look at the uh, recruitment or employment figures. Right now, um, in terms of unemployment, and for us as an organization, we've done a research that that's shows um, migrant individuals or minority individuals in Scotland are overqualified, but they're still getting into um, low income roles. Is it because AI is rejecting them or is it because of a human rejection? Thank you very much, Diana. Um, 
Ross, I don't know if you want to start picking up questions, but those were both um, great kind of introductions. Um, I think, do you want to start picking up questions, Ross, or should I run? Yeah, yeah, no, I, Emma, Emma was the first one in with okay. a question. Actually, if you want to jump in with yours, Emma, you popped in the chat box. Yeah, do you want me to actually yeah. unmute and speak? Nice to hear yes, from please. You. Yeah, yeah, nice yeah no, cool. Yeah, no, th you. they were really great. Thanks very much, uh, very much, both of you. I could have just kept going. You know the way it was like, oh, that sparked a thought, that sparked a thought. And then I thought, shut up, others need to go. I guess that the whole bias thing, um, yeah, that, that concerns me. And I was, I think my second point alluded to that. It's like, if you're a small organisation and you think, right, large organisations are doing this, We've got a disability employment gap. As you say, there's, there's other um, groups, people who are underrepresented in the workplace, people who want to work. If these large companies are using these tools and they have these bias and small co companies are uh, cannot use these tools or but think, gosh, we should use these tools, but we also want to address these, these, these social inequalities. Wh where do we begin? I guess I'm just left thinking, Hmm. So is there anything within like 365 that we can start to use to improve the way we recruit, to make it more efficient for the smaller organizations? And also, how do we help um, influence some of the developers or the larger organizations to, um, to, to want to help to close the disability employment gap, et cetera, and think about the bias and, and actively uh, address it? So I guess I was just thinking, um, this is all really interesting. How, how do we begin? And I thought perhaps my key purpose coming in and thinking, I'm sure we could improve our recruitment in, in some way. And looking at this, I think we're doing some things right because 45% of our employees are disabled people. So that's increasing. We're doing that well. But I'm sure we could make it effective in other ways. And there may be biases we don't know about. So so where do, where do we begin? Because we can't do the big solution and we can't buy in that software. So I don't even know if that is coherent, but that's the jumble of thoughts that start to come to me that, mm -hmm. that makes sense um emma so we work in the employability and i think um not everyone i would say not everyone needs to be using the software yet that you know i think there's there's a rush as, as we're seeing with chat gpt everybody sort of run towards it you know we all want to jump in but there's ways that you can use so part of the con that i, I skipped out was there's a couple of organizations and there's a couple of um a recruitment organization in the, the states most of the information unfortunately i couldn't find anything that was uh, uk based as a seattle based um, organization so they use it to write inclusive uh, job description um, rather than it being about recruiting recruiting people um, some organizations another one called kerry kern they use theirs to find the right kind of candidates so organization not having to to look for it so I suppose for small organizations like yourselves I think talking more about how are you actually able to bring in individuals in your organization and then looking at your own data sets you know do you keep a record of how what, what you do what you know what kind of questions do you ask you know what works for you do you get feedbacks from the individuals that have been through your recruitment process and then you can use that information to if you were to use AI in the future use that information to then educate AI in the way that you have done it correctly in the human form. That could then inform inform other organizations because I think sometimes we're looking at large organizations for the answers, but we have to remember this large organizations, they tend to get it wrong, um, but have the money to kind of, as Amazon, they have the money to go in and fix it. So you could be the one to educate organization in this is how we've done it. And this is how we've trained our AI system to do it. So I'll recommend that for everybody. Don't think because you're small that you need to be like you actually, you're doing it right in a human form. So how do you use that to educate um, the software that you might use? But for now, I don't think you need to rush to use it. Lewis, did you want to? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, just to, to echo that. I mean, as as someone who, who recruits within a small organization, I would say there is no uh rush to 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 use this tool as i said it's it's early early days um there's there's still a number of kind of kinks in the system and i think what happens when you get some um uh technology like this uh is everyone gets really excited about it everyone's talking about ai now it's you know everything's everything's ai uh we all want to use ai let's add ai to everything and i i think 
what you find is that it takes a while for that to kind of settle down. I mean, I remember the the one before AI was a few years ago. Uh, I don't know if you remember about um, cryptocurrency and blockchain. And, and everything like that and there was a, a brilliant statistic that i i can't remember the exact number and, and i apologize for that I'll, I'll see if i can find it but um there was a statistic that if a company mentioned crypto or blockchain in their you know description of the company it increased their the value of the company without without any evidence to back up that they were worth a, a, an increased valuation just mentioning blockchain meant that their value went up or they really understood what the technology was but everyone was excited about it and they were like we must have blockchain in these companies that we're investing uh, in and so i think for for smaller organizations um i my personal opinion is let the big organizations jump in and spend all the money on it and potentially you know not waste money but make the mistakes early on in the meantime as uh, as Brianna said you know focus on on your on on the human side of things uh, focus on you know what's going on within your business are the uh, are your interviewers um you know aware of potential biases are they doing potentially anti-bias training etc um there are some free tools out there that that uh, can be used to to improve um biases so uh, I don't know if uh, if anyone's ever used it, but um, Cat Matfield's uh, gender decoding tool uh, was a, it was a project by I assume someone called Cat Matfield for for a university project. Uh, it's free online, and basically you can add um, uh, job descriptions into it, and it will tell you whether the job description is male uh, coded or female coded. Ah, Ross just put it in the uh, in the chat, um, and it's been shown that psychologically, if uh, if a job description is more male coded. Uh, it actually puts female applications, uh, f- female applicants off from applying. Um, so you can use tools. There are tools like that that can help as well. Um, so yeah, my my personal opinion is let let the big companies make the mistakes with with the tool because they're very excited and they want to they want to use the shiny new thing as soon as it comes out. Um, and then once it once all the kink get worked out, which I'm I'm sure they will, uh, then that's when a it will start becoming cheaper and maybe more affordable for smaller companies. But b uh, you're less likely to be um, potentially spending money on something that that has these flaws in it. Brilliant, thank you, Wes. Great, thank you. Um, I popped a quick question in chat, if that's all right. Um, but if anybody else was sitting on a question, um, jump in if you'd like to. I think one thought I had was about, obviously, the discussion we've had and the kind of focus has been AI isn't a magic bullet and it could be, it's encoding bias and could create more problems. And I wondered if that thought process has prompted any reflections about potential hidden bias that already exists that we've maybe not thought about before. Um, so I think the example you gave, Lewis, about um, AI prioritising lacrosse players is one <laughs> funny example, but I wonder if that's maybe something that's going on in recruitment teams and employability teams is thinking about let's think more deeply about the whole process and look for ways we can reduce bias. Yeah, I, 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 to jump in, I, I think um, there, there has been um, that come up because I think, you know, we're, I'd, well, I'd like to think that everyone is aware of more obvious forms of bias um, and, uh, you know, the, the more um, structural issues that exist from that perspective. But I think one of the things that... Um, AI tools have shown us is that sometimes these biases uh, can exist from other places. So that you know the 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 funny story about lacrosse players and and people. I think it was lacrosse players and people called Jared. Um, I, for, I don't entirely know why, but they looked into why potentially it was the case that it was favouring people uh, who played lacrosse in high school or, or who were called Jared. And it ended up, I believe, being a, a um, kind of a class-based uh, reason. So, you know, lacrosse tended to not get played at, at lower income schools in America. It was more of a, a higher income school. So effectively, the AI was looking at people who had played um, lacrosse in high school. They tended to go to better schools. Therefore, they tended to go to better colleges. Therefore, they tended to be, you know, their CVs were more ready for, for being hireable, et cetera, when they got out of college. Um, and so actually what it was doing was it was um, it was uh, showing a, a kind of a, a structural, um, I guess, classism in, in, in recruitment that, that can exist. And so I think absolutely, I, I think uh, it's showing us that there are more subtle forms of 
uh, bias and discrimination that exists out there, um, which we do need to be more aware of as uh, as as a recruiter, um, but also as a society. I think um, I, I've done uh, a number of things in the past where I've worked with people on uh, CV writing skills, and you know I was uh, very lucky that the school that I went to taught me how to write a CV and taught me you know this is how you can structure a CV, this is how you can make it look good, these are some of the things that you can put in it. Um, a lot of people don't don't get that that education, and, and so it means that when uh, when they come to write their CV for the first time, um, they uh, they're not potentially writing a CV that when it lands on the desk of a recruiter, it will potentially look as uh, as strong as someone who has had that that education. That now it's not necessarily the recruiter's fault because they will just look at the cv on face value and they will look at it and say well this cv is better than that cv but they're not necessarily looking at the reason as to why that cv might not be as good and actually the candidate with the less good cv might be a stronger candidate but they've just not been taught how to write a cv or how to complete a job application and so um yeah definitely things that need to be considered and uh, i think as as recruiters and but hiring managers as well you need to have a, an awareness of the reasons why uh, potentially things might not be as strong or why things uh, applications might be written in a certain way or uh, why it's coming across that way rather than maybe making the, the judgment based on face value. Thank you. Uh, Viana, did you want to come in on that one yeah, as well? Absolutely. So I think for us, um, we'll probably have the, the opposite in that I experienced as being an employability. So we our focus is supporting people into work and getting into work. So we spent a lot of time with um, working with people on their CVs and cover letters and doing all of that of, you know, getting it right for what the employers are asking for. But then we still find people being rejected and especially working with the communities that we work with, we're starting to see we're, we're eliminating what could possibly the reason be the reason why they've been rejected for the role. Um, and then we're able to see, is it because of discrimination, for example, um, the discrimination of where they were educated. Um, you know, if they don't have the UK qualification, that could be a reason why they've been uh, rejected from the role. We're seeing a lot and hearing a lot of accent bar barriers as well. Um, so not having a, a, an English accent or a Scottish accent or something um, that could potentially block you from that opportunity. Um, and once people are in, in that role, again, it's a lack of progression, the lack of, of training a potential in these, in, these, um, in, in these settings where we're seeing then people leaving and start, starting the cycle again. So I think for organisations in terms of their recruitment is really looking at, honestly, looking at your recruitment process of where the people drop off and who are being selected. Um, it's interesting to hear your, your story there, uh, Lewis. Something that I think AI is actually helping us is helping us to see where the biases are because these biases were they've been inputted into that system. So if people who've had who are obviously of a upper class, middle class who've played lacrosse and gone to um, you know fancier schools are getting a role, and that was just been that would just have been the 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 truth of what it was if it was a human um, recruiting. So those biases would have been put in there. So for organizations, it's really looking at that. What's the makeup of our company now? Who are the people in that company now? Where did they study? Maybe this is a, a deeper research that people need to do. Are we all from the same pool in terms of class, in terms of our education, in terms of background, the network, et cetera? It's about that honesty because you can see it when you're in your space. I know we're not all in an office, but you can really see you know, who are we, who do we have in our company and in how do we recruit and look at the rejection point. Who are we rejecting at, and what basis are we rejecting people? Is it because of the qualification? Is it because of how they've written their CV? So there's a lot of question. And I mean, this is the work that we tend to do with organizations in terms of that inclusive recruitment and then creating that inclusion is really being honest about your process of how we've done it. Um, and we tend to look at out, outside, but it's about looking inside. What 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 is our what is our uh, conscious or unconscious bias that constantly keeps playing out, and then obviously not diversifying the workplace. Thanks very much. Um, I just want to check if there's any other questions uh, from chat, or if people have got something in mind. If not, I've got two practical questions, which we'll, we'll probably use up our last five minutes. So. 
a few practical ones. Um, you gave the example, Lewis, of a really obvious use of generative AI in an application, but you also gave the caution of not using a tool to try and filter because they're flawed and could um, falsely score stuff. I wonder what your response might be if you did see that. Would you automatically say, well, if it's a really obvious use of AI, would you say that's not going to go further? Or would you have a process where you might talk to a candidate? Um, don't feel you need to put yourself on the spot if you don't want to kind of review a kind of detail. But um, I think that's a, I'm asking that question because I know of somebody who said to me anecdotally the other day, oh, yeah, we saw something that looked really obviously like they've been using chat GPT in their application process. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting one. Um, it, it it's it is a difficult one because it is becoming more increasingly um, used. I think in the system that uh, the process that we have used up until now within within the business, where we were relying uh, solely on the answers to the application questions, ultimately, I think in in that situation. Uh, we would probably, if, if we could tell that a candidate had used um, an AI-related tool, we would probably reject them because ultimately uh, we are assessing candidates on their answers to the questions. And if we know that they've not answered that question, then we can't really uh, legitimately uh, assess them. Um, I, I think in, in other processes where maybe you're using it as part of a process rather than maybe the entire process, if you're looking at a you know, a CV and a, a, an application question and maybe a technical test or whatever it might be, um, then maybe you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't weight it that heavily. Um, so I, I guess the answer is it depends a little bit. With with that situation in particular, I mean, as I said, the, the first line was, uh, I can't remember the exact wording now, but it was if effectively I'm an AI programming tool, I have no feelings. Um, I think that would always probably get a rejection because uh, if you're going to use AI, I feel like at least, you know, at least check it to make sure that you've not written something like that. Um, that that to me shows a, a lack of uh, a lack of double checking your work rather than maybe necessarily using the uh, the AI tool as, as the problem. Great, thank you. Did you want to say anything on that, Viano, or because I got a second question I might follow up with? Um, so this came up when I was talking to funders about um, I was doing a workshop with them and using AI, and we talked about might you use generative AI to help you write feedback to people that didn't get funded? And the reason why is that people always say, we'd really appreciate feedback, even if we're not successful, because that could be very useful. But funders say, well, they maybe get dozens, if not hundreds of applications they can't fund. It's very time consuming to take maybe a summary and then turn that into a friendly sounding letter. So the question I would have in a recruitment setting might be, you know, that's often a kind of challenge is particularly if it's your first sift, you're saying, well, that's a very large number. We can't have somebody sitting down and writing long individually crafted responses, but there might be some summary points that you could use a generative AI tool to kind of expand a bit. And I wondered if anybody had thought about that or had any kind of quick responses to it. Absolutely. Um, I That's when AI, so using chat for me is like an intern. Um, and you now, if you're paying for chat, you now have a function where you can tell it what you do and you can put some key, you know, so create a prompt that asks chat to write a response that is, you know, in terms of your words, it's, it's inclusive, it's a positive, it's, you know, letting people know they've been rejected, but in a way that it's human sounding. So that will take away some time. Um, yeah, you can basically use it as your intern um, to do that. But obviously check that is not putting in, I am a robot and I can't write any rejection forms. Um, you can definitely do that. It's about the prompts that you use. I mean, this is a new job now, prompt engineering. Um, you can create those key things that you need to do. Um, I was just, I just, I was watching something recently, sorry. Um, and it was talking about connecting bots to your chat to help you streamline any anything that you do daily that kind of consumes your time. And this is how people are using it um, now, but just make sure that your prompt is actually sounding like you. Yeah, yeah I think just to, this. sorry, yeah, just to, to, to jump on the back of that, I think that's, I think that's very true is it can be uh, used as, as part of, for example, that process. So when it comes to rejections, I mean, ultimately working recruitment, um, most recruitment uh, teams will have uh, kind of template based rejections anyway for, for people at the, um, uh, the early stage of the process. I mean, you know, if you get 
10,000 applications for a role or whatever it is. You're not going to handcraft and as much, you know, as much as you'd like to, uh, you're not going to handcraft an individual uh, kind of rejection to each, uh, each candidate that's tailored to them. Um, and so most of the time, what companies have done is they've tended to just have a, a draft, you know, a template email they send to, to everyone. Um, if anything, I think AI could actually improve that because you could you could say, uh, here is, you know, here is our template rejection. Please uh, kind of use this template and then assess this candidate's CV and explain, you know, in a couple of words, why why we've specifically rejected them on, uh, from this perspective. Um, rather than just sending the generic template by itself, so I, I think actually there's there's potential for for it to improve those processes. Uh, but again, the technology has got to be there, and you've got to make sure that you're not um, sending uh, an email that that clearly has been written by a robot and, and doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I guess the obvious point is if some bug or glitch in the AI gave a response that missed something, Ross has to go to another meeting just now, and um, but we'll finish with the point. But if it missed something which you're then representing us from you, the recruiter, you'd have to be very careful there to make sure you could stand behind it. Yeah, um, you still have to check it. I think yeah. um, whatever you're going to send out, you still have to check. And then you can see if it's obviously the same letter or information. Yeah. The first one you've checked, you can see already that's correct. So always double, triple check for everyone, employers or individuals, always check. Yeah, yeah. and I think the way you've framed it, Vianna, is working with an intern is quite good because it's saying there's good intentions there but maybe lacking in experience and context so that's a really handy way of framing great um so if there's no other uh, questions from the room i just want to say a big thank you to lewis and diana for shining a light on this really interesting area and spending their time and um, really grateful also grateful for the questions of engagement this will be um on a website as a recording on our YouTube channel. Um, Ross has popped a link in. If you go to our website, you'll see other events coming up soon. Uh, hopefully somebody can get to the gathering, which is our in-person event in Edinburgh on the 7th and 8th of November. And then the November duty shift will be as always the last Wednesday of the month. So thanks again so much for joining us and for the discussion and, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Cheerio. Thank you very much.